Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm David Whitman, the president of Hamilton College. And with me is Ben Casper Sanchez, the director of the Center for New Americans at the University of Minnesota Law School. We're going to be having a conversation this morning about immigration law and policy. I've got a number of questions, some of which were submitted by viewers from our Facebook site. And anyone who's watching this, we would encourage you to submit your own questions if you like. You can do it by using the comments section on our Facebook post. So Ben, you have a lot of expertise in this area. Do you want to tell people just a little bit about your background and what the Center for New Americans does? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm an immigration lawyer by training, by training at the University of Minnesota Law School, uh, where I recall you were the dean <laughs> until about 12 months ago. Um, Full disclosure, uh, yeah. I've, I've worked with Ben for yeah, four yeah. or five years now. Yeah, and I owe my career to you. But <laughs> well, I like that yeah, framing. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but mainly in the areas of deportation defense and family-based immigration. After law school, I, I, I worked for a nonprofit agency and then at home uh, while my wife went to college and uh, helped raise our kids. And that led me to focus more on, on appellate work, things I could do at home, and that in turn led me to do collaborative work with some of the nonprofit agencies and the serving immigrants in the Twin Cities areas and, um, and working with some larger law firms that had resources to put into that work. Um, that collaboration was the seed for, for the Center for New Americans uh, at the University of Minnesota Law School, which is a clinical-based program, uh, uh, a series of three clinics within, within the law school that train students uh, through supervision uh, under supervision of um, practicing attorneys like myself and my colleagues Linus Chan and Steve Miley to, to represent immigrants in a different areas of, of, of the deportation process or the asylum process. Um, my clinic focuses on federal impact litigation right. um, and uh, that program uh, was unique because it was designed to, as a partnership with large law firms and the principal um, nonprofit immigrant legal services um, offices in, in the Twin Cities area. Just a community of advocates mm -hmm. surrounding the work of law students and engaging the law students in that work. Um, and it's been successful. We've so, been permanently endowed thanks to your leadership. So, <laughs> so the center kind of leverages the combined expertise Absolutely. of three law firms, three leading nonprofits, yep. and the law school to work on immigration law and policy. And the brilliance of law students, yep. And the brilliance of yep. law students. And you've got three clinics, a, deport, yep. a detainee rights clinic, That's right. an immigration litigation clinic. And federal immigration. Litigation. And then the um, yeah. uh, asylum clinic yep. Yep. and an yep. education program. Yep. All right, well, so there's a lot to talk about. As you know, the world has changed in many ways when it comes to immigration law and policy and mm -hmm. not changed in some other ways. Right. A lot of people expressed considerable concern in the last six months about what's yep. been happening around enforcement efforts. Yeah. So can you say a little bit about what has changed and what hasn't changed in terms of enforcement action? Yeah. Are deportations up in number? You know, what, what really has changed in the last six months? Yeah, I mean, in the last six months, probably not. I mean, in the, the first part of the answer is what's the baseline? The baseline mm -hmm. is many years in the Obama administration um, spending billions of dollars each year right. on immigration-related enforcement. Um, immigration-related enforcement at the, you know, at the federal level, uh, that budget, about $18 billion, dwarfs mm -hmm. all other law enforcement activity of the, the federal government. Um, this is about $4 billion more than the combined total of all other federal immigration. That got us about 400,000 deportations per year right. under, under, under existing statutes and regulations and and then that, important policies. Is that number pretty consistent at 400,000 Pretty consistent for a number of years, yeah. Even as the level of in-migration net mm -hmm. from, from on the southern border, Mexico and Central America, has fallen dramatically down to a, about a net right. of zero now. But So, so just yeah. to yeah. expand on that, yeah. what, what is the actual, it, it's really net zero, so the, the number of people leaving is essentially equivalent to the number of people coming That's in? That's right, that's right. And that, that historically we saw numbers on the plus side, hundreds right. of thousands for, for decades. and Coming um, in. Coming in, yeah. coming in. And um, for a variety of reasons, I think primarily economic, mm -hmm. um, it's fallen to, to net zero. And so and, a lot of people are finding work in, in, from, in countries they would ordinarily have been leaving to come to the United States, and so they're staying, is that? That's right, I think that's probably yeah. the principal driver of that. I mean, there's a lot of 
research and theory on that, yeah. but, but, but I think that's pretty commonly accepted. So we were at around 400,000 deportations a year in the Obama administration, right. and where are we now? Right, and that's an extraordinary number of deportations, and that impacts thousands, thousands and thousands of families. Um, and the important thing to understand is that undocumented immigrants or immigrants who are deported typically are not individuals. They are parts of families. And families, so right. right. But um, there's been no legislation under the Trump administration that's mm -hmm. been passed. There's been no um, increases in, 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 in budget. Um, and I haven't seen any data that would suggest that the number of deportations has gone up. Um, what has gone up is fear, yeah. um, and I think the fear is driving, uh, a, likely driving a certain degree of out migration. Some families. So fear on the part of immigrants. undocumented immigrants mm -hmm. who are here in the United yeah. States, leading some to leave voluntarily, or at yep. least because they're afraid of enforcement action. Yes, and uh, you know, again, we don't have hard data yeah. on this, but I'm, I, I've seen it anecdotally in my practice, again and again mm -hmm. in my community. So I think that's happening. Um, and, uh, but, um, you know, even if the Trump administration were able to get legislation passed or additional budgets, um, they've talked about increasing the number of border patrol agents, mm -hmm. um, ICE agents and, uh, immigration judges, all of that process is going to take years in the bureaucratic yeah. system, probably longer than his admin first term. So His just, term will um, will last. So yeah. just to identify those agents mm -hmm. and judges, train them, yep. get them through whatever process is needed to appoint them, yep. will take three, four years. I think that's right. So I think it's unlikely that we'll see dramatically higher numbers relative mm -hmm. to the very high numbers that the Obama administration was 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 already um, able to to do. Um, but I think the impact is primarily in the predictability and the nature of right. those removals. Um, for many years, under the Obama administration, you had more predictable enforcement focused on priorities, mm -hmm. not established by statute or regulation, formal regulation, but by agency policy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, they would focus on individuals with more serious criminal records and, and not enforce um, deportation upon people with families right. um, who who have strong family ties or long, long periods of, of, of uh, residence in the United States. That sort of framework has now been lifted by the mm -hmm. Trump administration, leaving, leading to a lot of fear, coupled with political rhetoric that's, that's, um, um, that's the main difference. But that's, I don't think yeah. the numbers are, are, are probably different at this point. Yeah. So we have a question from one of our viewers. Mm -hmm. Tommy from New Mexico asks, so the $18 billion ICE budget mm -hmm. gets us $400,000, 400,000 deportations mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. That's $45,000 each. I haven't checked his math, but let's assume that's right. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to be spending $45,000 to deport someone? And he says, worth debating is his question. <clears throat> um, well, yeah, I mean, there's some premises buried in that question there. Mm -hmm. I think, I think um, a, I think that, yeah, that is an incredible expenditure of money. Um, and, 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 and B, there's the cost, uh, not just in, in money, but in, but in human dignity and, um, and, and cost to communities and to our economy of removing uh, people who are very typically parts of families that include U.S. citizens and mm -hmm. legal residents. Um, we're performing central work in our economy and providing sort of the diversity economically to our right. to our economy nationally that that really was essential to to the growth of the 80s, 90s, and mm -hmm. the early 2000s prior to the recession. Um, not putting aside the sort of demographic um, mismatch um, with the baby boomers that that immigration really is a key component of, yeah. of counterbalancing. So. Um, I think economically, to start with, as a major premise, there are huge costs to, to mm -hmm. removing um, people from their families and the communities they're in now, uh, putting aside just the, the raw no val you know, um, cost of, of yeah. carrying out that sort of an immigration action. So, yeah. so um, since when President Trump came into office, he issued an executive order. Yeah. Um, 
which was challenged and then blocked in the courts. There was a revised executive <coughs> order that's yeah. also been um, challenged and partially blocked in the courts. Yeah. I know the Center for New Americans was involved in some of the litigation around the first executive order, I think. That's right. Um, can you summarize the issues in the litigation and tell us where things stand now? Yeah, well, very briefly, it's a very complex set of different actions that have, that have happened around the country. But right now we're talking about the um, what's been called the travel ban or the Muslim ban, um, the limitation originally on seven predominantly Muslim countries, now mm -hmm. in the revised order, six predominantly Muslim countries after they removed Iraq. Um, uh, when that was that that uh, executive order came out in late January. It was immediately challenged in federal courts across the country, mm -hmm. often in class-based litigation uh, by private plaintiffs, um, and then in in one notable case um, started by the state of Washington, by the state of right. Washington itself, um, that was soon thereafter joined by the state of Minnesota. Um, these lawsuits were moving on parallel tracks. But the ban itself um, stopped, essentially aimed to stop the admission of all refugees, mm -hmm. temporary resettlement of refugees for a period, from these six, seven predominantly um, Muslim nations uh, because of how poorly it was crafted, yeah. the, the original motion, um, was read to bar even lawful permanent residents in the United States, mm -hmm. green card holders, from traveling in or out of the United States. Um, any admissions on, on visas of any kind, student visas, um, uh, refugee admissions from these countries. So it was, um, it, it caused chaos. Yeah. It caused utter chaos in the immigration system when it was mm -hmm. first imposed, and the legal challenges to it focused primarily on, on religious discrimination and due process um, related to the separation of, of Institutions, state institutions, or mm -hmm. families mm -hmm. from from individuals um, from one of these seven named countries coming into the country, coming into the United States. Um, now, the Washington litigation resulted in the first nationwide stay, temporary injunction. Right. Um, and Minnesota was part of that litigation. Our students, uh, Charles Moore, Nadia Angianum, um Reed, and uh, uh, Maher Mahmoud, helped. Me, along with some of our other students, helped helped me collect affidavits, and declarations, primarily from individuals in the Somali community, mm -hmm. um, that the state of Minnesota could then use as evidence of yeah. the impact of, of the of the ban. And for mm -hmm. people who don't know, Minnesota has the largest Somali community outside of Somalia. It does, yes, and 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 um, importantly for us, it's. <laughs> The center of it's located about two blocks from the law school. Yeah. There's tens, tens of thousands of Somalis mm -hmm. who've relocated in the, as refugees over the last 20, 25 years. You know. And um, so we were, we were very happy to be part of, part of that uh, initial phase of the litigation. Um, it did result in a nationwide stay that yeah. behind that litigation in many federal courts continued. Mm -hmm. And that was appealed the stay, right. not the ultimate resolution of the merits of the suit, but the stay was appealed to a appellate court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, because mm -hmm. it was rising in Washington. That's their jurisdiction. The Ninth Circuit uh, agreed uh, with the decision to stay, and then while the Trump administration stated they would continue fighting that initially up to the Supreme right. Court, th I think they, they, they understood tactically that the order itself was so flawed um, that it wouldn't stand. That it wouldn't stand, and they, mm -hmm. they abandoned it in favor of a second. That they now there's litigation over that right. whether it's actually yeah. a second second order order if it yeah. has any meaningful um, grounding legally beyond the first one. That's that's being uh, litigated now again through the courts. Right. In that second wave, uh, Hawaii notably stepped in mm -hmm. and filed a, a state based lawsuit. Um, along with an imam who was being separated from a family yeah, member. Yeah. And that resulted in a second stay that's now in place nationwide, behind mm -hmm. which even more litigation is taking place. So there are scores of lawsuits across circuits, right. courts around the country, um, but 
the, the, the travel ban itself is, is, is being blocked. Is blocked currently. Mm -hmm. So and just to say that the standard for blocking it is that there's a strong likelihood of success on the part of the challengers that, that will be found illegal, unconstitutional. So likelihood of success on the merits. On the merits through. of the ultimate yeah. case. Yeah. 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 So how do you respond to people who say we need the executive orders, we need similar kinds of actions, similar constraints on immigration in order to protect the national security interests of the United States? Well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think at two levels. I mean, one is that we did a pretty good job. I mean, I think there's a lot of public servants in the Department of Homeland Security who would tell you they're pretty proud of there being no major foreign launched terrorist attacks in the United States since 9-11, mm -hmm. and that's true. Um, all, all the evidence that I've seen, that I'm aware of, is that, that um, the vetting process already in place um, works. I mean, it, it protects mm -hmm. national security. Um, and that um, ultimately the greater national security concern, as many people, is, is the perception of the United States yeah. is upholding certain principles of human rights and, and, and due process and, and non-discrimination. And I do think that that calculation, in that calculation, mm -hmm. I, I tend to agree with that view. Um, and uh, over time, I think as a national security matter, we're, we're less safe. If, if we don't stand with those basic values, um, those would be my, my two yeah. levels of response. Good. But I would say also that I think that the, the part of part of the reaction to the first executive order um, banning travel from Muslim countries was the impact it had on frontline employees. Um, it felt like it was sabotaging them because it was frontline employees of, of the Homeland Department security. of Homeland Security, yeah. the State Department, um, who who had no advance notice, no participation mm -hmm. in 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 the vetting of, of the language or the substance of, of the order. Um, and so it it, it 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 felt to me from the outside not only as as a as an action directed at at creating um, Attention and 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 conflict over over issues of of um, religion mm -hmm. and national origin, but also to create maximum chaos by by um, blindsiding you know public servants within our government who are in charge to enforce the law, and I think that's part of what doomed it in court initially. You know? the, the executive order. Yeah. So, so I want to ask a question that kind of goes to first principles, mm -hmm. and the question yeah. comes from Michael in yeah. Hamilton College's class of 1969, mm -hmm. and he asks, do you think borders should exist, or should we <clears throat> dispense with passports and identity checks as an anachronistic? And if borders are defined, what, what is the responsibility of the government to manage illegal crossings of the borders? So should they exist, and what's the responsibility of the government to enforce the border? Yeah, well, I mean, I think... Um, that's a pretty deep question. I mean, I, I think that if you're going to, if you start with the premise, if you accept the premise of a, a sovereign state, the United States, mm -hmm. um, within its territories, then borders are part of that. But what borders are and how they're enforced is uh, a wide, wide range of, of policy there. Um, I think the context in which the, the borders are, are Operate and their and their protection is undertaken is is crucial. Right now, there is a pent up demand based on family right. relationships and economy that we discussed mm -hmm. um, that puts a great deal not of push just push from from foreign countries um, populations in the United States, but you know massive pull factor. Mm -hmm. um, and really, we're looking at laws that were imposed about twenty years ago that on top of earlier laws that have dramatically shrunk uh, um, the opportunities to immigrate and reunify with family mm -hmm. and to rationally, efficiently meet the needs of our economy. So you're saying it's gotten much, uh, much, harder. Much, much harder to get into this country over the last 20 years? Much harder. At the same yeah. time, we've essentially militarized the border to mm -hmm. protect um, 
in an effort to 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 stop undocumented crossings. So there's, a, there's a fundamental yeah. schizophrenia in, in, in policy. Um, there's economic pull factors. There's humanitarian fundamental family reunification pull factors. And by pull factors, economic pull factors, you mean the, the, just the, the United States needs yeah. fundamentally needs and always has welcomed yeah. um, these folks into the United States. But at the same time, we operate with massive resources to, to stop the same inflows. So there's, there's a fundamental mm -hmm. schizophrenia in, in immigration policy. There has been for 20 years. Um, there has been, essentially, we know there have been bipartisan majorities um, in Congress to, to pass what they call comprehensive immigration reform, which would try to rationalize right. that right. and take, to try to cure some of that schizophrenia um, and for, for narrower issues of political dysfunction going to the you know, more fundamental mm -hmm. uh, problems in our political system that hasn't, that majority hasn't been able to work yeah. as well. Okay. So Stephen in the Hamilton class of 1960 asks, how can we continue to maintain a liberal outlook on immigration in the face of mass migration <coughs> of millions of dispossessed souls, a migration that only grows? I think to some extent you may have answered this when you talked about yeah. what is net migration, but do you want to just say a little bit more about yeah, what, what are the long-term trends in terms of inflows of people, at least into this country? Clearly, there are you know, millions and millions of displaced people around the world. There's, there's immigration into a lot of countries. Yeah. In, in the United States, if I heard you right, we're at pretty much net zero. So, yeah. so how would you respond to this question? You well, know, are we seeing... Yeah, and I, would, I, I could give you a little more detail on the, on the numbers related to, to, to not just you know, net migration, but but enforcement at the border, particularly the southern border. I mean, what has this, what have these billions of dollars bought us over the last right. year? About, a, if you go back about 15 years only, there were about 1.5 million or more apprehensions by U.S. Border Patrol mm -hmm. um, annually. And that's fallen now to, I think, about 400,000 total per year. Yeah. And um, so we're at historically very low levels of actual apprehension. Um, and in that context, um, you know, I think the biggest hue and cry in the United States has been over the last several years, that had the largest political impact was the inflows of children and women mm -hmm. and families from Central America um, who have been fleeing really semi-failed states in yeah. Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Those are heart-wrenching um, asylum cases. Um, and, but we're talking about 150, 160,000 mm -hmm. people per year, which in historical terms is a, is a, is a very manageable small number of people to, to, um, to treat within our existing systems and to, to treat with due process and, and concern for, for whether they are right. genuine refugees. Right. Um, but politically, we've seen sort of a reaction to them. You would, you would think that we were facing historically large numbers of, right. of, of, of apprehensions, and, 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 but that's just, it's not the case. Um, and you compare that, it's interesting to compare that to what's happening in Europe where, you know, in, in Germany and other countries, you have seen right. numbers of people entering those states that have like their proportion yeah. <laughs> of the population, yeah. and those states have been challenged, obviously politically um, and institutionally. But um, it is interesting to see how they've tr at least tried mm -hmm. to stick to, to fundamental principles of, of, of refugee law that we share with them under international right. law. Um, while in our country, the reaction to a really a drop in the bucket has been has been, I think, disproportional. But that's my view. Yeah. So, so we do we do see in the yeah. United States, in Europe, in a lot of countries, an yeah. effort to tighten controls on immigration, yep. yeah. and some of it stems from concerns around terrorism. Yeah, we got a comment from um, one of our viewers that I, yeah. I want to share with you that relates to this question of national security, and he yeah. says. There's a point to be made here. National security is different from and not affected by the recent lone wolf attacks, San Bernardino, Pulse nightclub, and so on. Mm -hmm. 
These are tragic, yes, but they are not existential threats to the U.S. Existential threats are those that would shut down the normal daily operation of the entire country mm -hmm. or major regions of it. So I assume he's referring to 9-11 style attacks. And I'm not sure if this is quite what he meant, but I, I think what he's saying is, you know, we may have been successful in avoiding attacks since 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, apart from these lone wolf attacks. Mm -hmm. But should we not be doing everything we can to, uh, to prevent these you know, truly existential threats? And is that, is that what you know, the Trump administration is trying to do? Or you know, how, how do you view it in that context? I, I guess I can't comment on what the Trump administration is trying to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard to read. Um, I, mean, I do think there, <laughs> most, of, most of that work is probably done, and we're not hearing about it. I mean, I think, and then there's questions of nuclear proliferation, of course. Yeah. But uh, again, I would go back to the, to the, the security value of being viewed as a country that has principles mm -hmm. of, of adherence to human rights and, and due process of law. That feels to me like the, the overarching security um, concern. Um, I, I, um, I don't know if that's responsive, but um, I, 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 there's no question that the United States government is, is engaged in constant um, anti-terrorism efforts that appear to be pretty successful, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at least in their you know, net total result. We just haven't had those attacks. And the ones that have happened have been typically totally. native-born citizens who, who have mental health issues. Um, and um, yeah, and how you respond to that without undermining um, fundamental principles of law, I think, is, is, the, is the challenge for us politically. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a question from oh. Jeff in the class of 1966, mm -hmm. and he says, not wishing to be overly dramatic, mm -hmm. but aren't California's and other states' unilateral actions, e.g. sanctuary cities, um, he says, the stuff of civil war, or at least the seeds thereof, I, you know, is, is it something that's going to divide the country? What's the authority? of a state or a city to try and adopt an immigration policy different than that of the federal government? And where do sanctuary cities fall yeah. into this? Well, I mean, I, I would say a couple things. First, um, there's no question that, that the enforcement of immigration law, who comes into the United States, who can mm -hmm. be admitted, who can be deported, that's under the U.S. Constitution. That's purely federal law. Mm -hmm. And there's a supremacy clause in the United States Constitution that says federal law prevails. States don't have any ability to directly re regulate immigration. Um, that's not really what the sanctuary city debate about is about. Um, there we're talking about what latitude do states have to adopt policies that they think are uh, effective for primarily law enforcement um, mm -hmm. at a local or state level um, with respect to engaging actively with with, yeah. with, with U.S. federal immigration agents. And many, many states, most law enforcement leaders have taken the position that, um, that it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to inquire about the immigration status of people um, who might be undocumented mm -hmm. uh, at a state or local level and to actively share that information with federal immigration agents because doing so would cause fear, and right. it does, right. in those populations and, 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 and result in failure to report crimes, mm -hmm. um, failure to cooperate with police, and overall degradation of the state and local police authority, and it's just not their job. So most of these policies are what would really be accurately called separation policies. Mm -hmm. It's not that if they know, happen to know about someone's immigration status, it's and, and, and it's a serious felony, and, yeah. and federal agents are looking for that person that they won't cooperate. You know, it's more that they won't collect that information as a matter of, as a general matter of policy at the state right. and local level in order that it could be shared with the federal government. Mm -hmm. They're just not performing federal functions. I, I think that's pretty clearly legal. There's been at least one case. Yeah, I don't know if you were going to ask me about the case. Uh, well, that, sure. Well, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, that's a separate executive order yeah. that the that the current administration 
um, has issued, it's threatened to, to, to defund cities that, right. that, um, that have separation ordinances of this nature. So far, the one court that's ruled on it has blocked it. Saying that's a federal that. district court. That's a federal district court Which, saying, um, we don't think the government could defund. We mm -hmm. think the, the challenging cities um, are, again, substantially right. likely to win on the merits of the case because essentially this is the federal government trying to commandeer the law enforcement. Local, local resources. The local resources of, 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 of police and other state agencies. And, you know, um, I think they're pretty solid ground. And, right. um, but again, it's, a, it's, it's part of a political um, debate, too, and it's attached a lot of attention to it. Yeah. it yeah. Now, is there a message in this for college campuses which might be worried about a cutoff of federal funding? But what can college campuses do if they want to support students who are concerned about possible immigration enforcement activity? What can they do and what can't they do? Well, I mean... I think they can speak forcefully in support of humane treatment of all people, regardless of immigration status and nationality, race, mm -hmm. religion. Um, and I think that, um, I, I don't think that colleges can, on anyone's view of the law, yeah. block federal agents from conducting, or local police right. agencies from conducting um, Otherwise, lawful investigations or arrests where they would occur. It's just not. Right. It's just not a problem they right now. Think, yeah. It's not. It's that. I don't think it's a practical, um, ongoing concern. I do think that a lot of attention's properly being paid to DACA students, mm -hmm. students who benefited from the Obama administration's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, the Dreamers. About 750,000 such students. Mm -hmm. it did not surprise me as a political matter that the current administration decided to leave that group of, of people alone right. for now. Um, I think theoretically there are potential concerns um, depending on the, the path that the, the administration takes. But so far we've seen small numbers of isolated uh, actions against, against DACA recipients, DACA mm -hmm. beneficiaries, but it hasn't been a systemic thing. But I think campuses um, can, um, and leadership on campuses can take a strong principled stand for, for, for the dignity and human rights of people on their campus and for the families in their surrounding communities and the families of their students yeah. in addition to the students themselves. Um, and and the, the ultimately, we're not going to litigate, yeah. people on my side are not going to litigate ourselves to, to, to justice here. This is really more a political and moral problem, in my view, than a legal, in the end. Yeah, yeah. than a strictly yeah. legal problem. Yeah. So we, we do have some students and faculty mm -hmm. who um, are not U.S. citizens mm -hmm. who worry a little bit about what happens if they travel abroad and immigration law changes or there's a new executive order. Yep. Is there much risk for you know, students and faculty traveling abroad who, who aren't U.S. citizens? Will they have trouble getting back into this country? Well, I mean, it depends on what country. I mean, there are these six countries, the six countries that are being protected right. by a court order right now. Mm -hmm. um, if they're, you know, the government has said legal permanent residents wouldn't be affected by this, but other right. visa holders potentially could be, depending on their status. People trying to, to get into the United States with new visas would be. Mm -hmm. Travel abroad could be uh, a legitimate concern. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would counsel them to talk to a, an immigration lawyer and 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 and. and, and if they were, especially from one of those six countries mm -hmm. before, before they travel abroad. I mean, my students, I remember Charles documented uh, the experiences of uh, an Iraqi professor on the University of Minnesota campus, U.S. citizen, and he was blocked for two weeks from getting back into the United yeah. States. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the chaos that I was talking about. But right. um, depending on the course of the litigation and the, 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 the status of the, the stays that are in place now, um, Things could go better or worse, right. and I think their um, caution is probably warranted. So, so we're, we're almost at the end of, the, yeah. of our time, but the one thing I wanted to ask you about, yeah. uh, as you look forward, yeah. you know, we've been talking about what's happened in the, you know, this immediate yeah. time period, but looking forward down the road, do you see any prospects for a bipartisan approach to immigration? There's a lot of talk about that. Yeah. In the last administration, it didn't materialize. 
Um, last two administrations. Yeah. Last two administrations. Yeah. You know, in the next few years or five, ten years, could we have a bipartisan approach? And if so, what might that look like? Well, we know what it looks like. I mean, there were 68 votes mm -hmm. in the Senate for for what they call a comprehensive immigration bill, which would create like a long, fairly long, I think arduously long, pathway to citizenship for undocumented individuals. Um, and uh, and also change some of the uh, rules for how we um, select incoming immigrants based right. on economic uh, concerns and, 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 and other factors, not just family relationships. But there were 68 votes in the Senate, the conservative Senate for that. Um, uh, we know that there was a majority in the House who would vote for it. And mm -hmm. I think those two things are true. What, what, exactly what, what numbers, I don't know. But that legislation almost passed in 2007. It almost passed in 2013. Oh. And I think that, you know, I think there's a, a generally a political majority consensus that that's what, that's what we know how yeah. To, yeah. To, to do some of the fundamental reforms that would fix the system and, and, uh, and save a lot of human anguish and, and money. But um, uh, the reasons that's not happening are, are more about um, structural and fundamental problems in our political system. Yeah. yeah. Well, let, let me ask one final question. Yeah. I, this is something a lot of um, yeah. viewers have asked about, and I, I don't think it'll come as a surprise. Yeah. As you know, President Trump is seeking congressional funding to build a wall yeah. on the border with Mexico. Yeah. What do you think is likely to happen with that effort? Well, I mean, I think just politically right now, it's, it's, uh, he doesn't have the political co coalitions. I mean, I think he's got a pretty badly divided Republican Party in pretty firm Democratic opposition put together, I think he's going to have trouble cobbling together a yeah. lot of uh, uh, funding support for a wall that is rhetorically useful, but it's, no one believes it, it actually could be done or would work or what it actually means even. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, I, I don't, uh, I'm not optimistic, I'm optimistic that, that, that that there won't be congressional funding for it, but there already is existing authority and um, to, longstanding to, to yeah. build um, really quite extensive walling, fencing. So stretches um, of the border could be. And our border is already hugely militarized. It yeah. has been for for back into the 1990s. So it really, it's all it's already it's already done, mm -hmm. and we're having a, a, a net zero migration period right now. It's just. Um, um, I, I, I don't think it's likely to happen, but... So that it, money could be better spent by being donated to Hamilton College, for example. That's, that's what I was going to say next, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I thought you were going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Ben, it's been yeah. a delight to have you yeah, here, and I yeah. know you've got a full set of activities today, including yeah, yeah. a lunch, which we'll be starting shortly. Looking forward to it. So we're going to sign off. I greatly yeah. appreciate uh, your advice. And, um, Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you, and thank yeah. you to our viewers for yeah. taking the time to watch today.